all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another Take 5 for Florida History. Today I'm looking at one of the earliest tourist attractions in St. Augustine. It's named Treasury Street and while it's merely a narrow lane only 165 feet or 50 meters long, it held a rather outsized level of importance in the minds of tourists for many decades from the 1800s well into the 20th century. Today it's somewhat forgotten even though it's still there and it hasn't changed much. Yet there's no sign to point it out to the millions of people who pass by and neither the Old Town Trolley Tours nor the Red Train Tours typically mention it. As I mentioned in my most recent video, What's Old in St. Augustine, there are hundreds of things for visitors to do in the city, so a random street won't be high on the list. But luckily, this is a history channel, not one that does attraction reviews. Since Treasury Street was once very popular with tourists, there's no question as to why it deserves a video. Let's look at the street, its origins, and how it got its name. I'll also cover two other tourist attractions directly connected with the street, including one that itself is basically forgotten, not leastways because it closed its doors in 1914. Yeah, it ceased operation nearly 110 years ago. The first thing I thought in looking at Treasury Street, which is proclaimed the narrowest street in the U.S., is to see, is it really? I don't normally Google historical info, but this was a special case. While we certainly shouldn't automatically trust the validity of search engine results, there aren't any websites that point to another town or city that boasts that it has the narrowest street in America. So Treasury Street likely holds the record in the U.S., which means we need to know just how wide it is. Like websites, postcards and guidebooks aren't always reliable with their statements, and the archive has documents to confidently state that it's as narrow as 6 foot 1, or up to 7 feet, as you can see here. This is one of the reasons why the archive is so valuable. You could have one or two postcards and just assume since they agree that the number is correct, but with 10 or more sources suggesting different widths, it basically tells us that at best, only one measurement is correct. Now obviously, the difference between 6 and 7 feet isn't that great, but I've always wondered who did the measuring and how. A few years ago, I did my own measurements and arrived at 9 feet on the ground at the Charlotte Street end, with a distance between the current buildings of about 10 and a half feet. That's wider than the historic measurements, but I believe those were all done with at least one building that is no longer there. Regardless, 9 feet is still plenty narrow, and for comparison, here's a standard shipping container for reference. And yes, that's a fake photo. Just wanted to make that clear. And to forge past other measurements, here's the info on the rest of Treasury Street. Yes, if you haven't seen the street in person, you might think that one block is it, but in fact, it takes knowing about the rest of the street to make the case for it actually be in a street and not just an alley or walkway. While the narrowest part lies between Bay and Charlotte, the rest is also pretty narrow. This graphic gives the length of the street as well as its general widths. Not surprisingly, it's a one-way street. Its western boundary is Cordova Street, and it's only four blocks long, which is about average for roads in the old city. How Treasury Street got its name and why it's narrow is connected to another historic site. Sitting at the corner of Treasury and St. George is the Peña Peck House. As I explained in my last video, historic homes are normally named after its most prominent owners. The Peña Peck House dates back to about 1750 and the first Spanish colonial period. It's also known as the Old Spanish Treasury as it was built for the Spanish royal treasurer Esteban de Peña. The house was built by the Spanish crown and was originally one story tall. It was made from coquina stone quarried on Anastasia Island and had floors of tabby. Like most of the other Spanish residents in St. Augustine, de Peña left the city when Florida was ceded to the British in 1763. 
The house acquired its glass windows, fireplaces, and chimneys during the British period, since both were not used in Spanish colonial buildings. The house would change owners several times until 1837, when it was purchased by Seth Peck, a doctor from Whiteboro, New York, and his wife Sarah. It was used as both his home and clinic. Peck added the second wooden story and wood floors covering the old tabby. They furnished the house with 18th century pieces in its many rooms, including a drawing room, sitting room, and three bedrooms all upstairs, as well as a kitchen, dining room, and Dr. Peck's offices below. The house remained in the Peck family until 1931 when Anna Burt, Peck's granddaughter, donated the house to the city with the stipulation that it be exhibited as an antebellum home. Because of the expense in maintaining and operating the house, the city awarded custodianship to the Women's Exchange. A nonprofit organization founded in 1892, the Women's Exchange has a mission to help women enhance their economic stability, promote local artisans, and preserve and show the historic Peña Peck House. Today, the house remains open as a museum and has a gift shop that sells local artistic creations. So as you probably realize, the street was named for the treasury, but why is it so narrow? Well, the street directly connects the royal treasury with the docks along the seawall. Traditionally, it's been said that the street was intentionally narrow to deter thieves. Supposedly, it was wide enough for two men carrying a chest of silver and gold, but not wide enough for a horse and carriage to drive by and snatch the loot. This image gives you an idea of what would be contained in such a chest. The main denomination of the empire was the peso, or as known to the English, the dollar. A Spanish peso was divided into eight reals, both figuratively and literally. While Spain minted real coins in several values, some people would cut their dollars into eight pieces, which is where we get the term pieces of eight. Sometimes those pieces, each worth one real, were also called bits, which connects to the archaic phrases, two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar, and shave and a haircut, two bits. To foil opportunistic thieves sounds reasonable, so let's take a closer look at it. The first thing is to look at a map. The treasury is only 650 feet or 200 meters from the seawall, with both Bay and Charlotte Streets crossing in between. By the way, Bay Street is so named because it runs along the water, which used to be called a bay. Today it's called the Matanzas River. Oddly enough, neither of those terms are correct for the body of water. It's better described as an estuary, essentially one of the many transitional waterways between Florida's rivers and the ocean. Looking at a map of the city shows that it's laid out in a grid pattern. This originates from its earliest days since it began as a military settlement. Treasury Street is just one of several leading away from the docks. If someone was to attempt to heist a chest of gold, it doesn't seem likely that this one simple precaution would be enough. The idea also presupposes that the said chest of gold would only be carried by hand. Why not be moved in a locked wagon like armored cars today? Also, remember that throughout the first Spanish period, there were soldiers at the Castillo and throughout the city perpetually keeping watch for the next attempt by the British to attack the city. Considering that some of that money would be their pay, it'd be pretty easy to have them protected. Yes, Treasury Street could have been designed to protect gold shipments, but there's a more likely possibility. This 1769 map shows that Treasury Street is the same width along its entire path. In fact, it shows that Hippolyta Street, just to its north, is a narrow street and only runs between Bay and Charlotte. Today it runs all the way to Cordova, just like Treasury Street, and is a typical width. The highly detailed map was drawn by Thomas Jeffrey, a cartographer with the British Royal Engineers, so we can trust that it's accurate. Plus, the map was created after the first Spanish period, when the treasury was no longer the treasury. 
This means that at some point, likely in the British period, a building or two were reconstructed that encroached upon the street. An old saying goes, it's better to beg forgiveness than ask permission. And regardless if permission was obtained or forgiveness was sought, it'd be new buildings that narrowed the street. Certainly, turning it into a walkway didn't change that much. I realize it may not be a romantic reason for the narrowest street in the U.S., but it's probably the correct one. And now, let's take a closer look at another building located on Treasury Street. By the way, when I first decided to cover this topic, I very briefly thought to do it as a take on Dr. Seuss's first book and to think that I saw it on Treasury Street. Uh, Sorry, Mulberry Street. But I digress. Located on the corner of Treasury and Bay Streets was a building known as the Rodriguez Arcean House. It was also built in the first Spanish colonial period. The building was at one point St. Augustine's Courthouse in jail. It was known for an immense fireplace and exposed cedar beams. It was a two and a half story house with a gable roof and was made of coquina. It was owned by Antonio Rodriguez Arcian, a soldier who was stationed at the Castillo. Arcian and his family left Florida for Mexico when the British took over the territory. When Spain got Florida back, Arcian. His descendants were able to get the property back in 1790. They'd later sell it to Francisco Javier Miranda. Dr. John Vetter, who was born in Schenectady, New York in 1819, would lease the house and in 1888 he would open the Vetter Museum, one of the first museums in St. Augustine. Vetter came from an old Dutch family that was among the early settlers of New Amsterdam. His father was a blacksmith and farmer who was one of six sons born to Johannes Vetter, who fought in the American Revolution. John would work on the Syracuse and Utica Railroad, starting off as a mechanic and eventually becoming an engineer. He married Eleanor James, though she died in 1851. Vetter would go on to remarry, this time to Mary Adams. Vetter's uncle, Dr. Elihu Vetter, entered the picture at this point. Elihu Vetter was a dentist, hence his use of the honorific doctor. Around 1840, he and his wife Elizabeth moved to Matanzas, Cuba. John Vetter would join his uncle in practice there in the late 1860s. He had said that he learned dentistry from reading up on the subject using his son Daniel's textbooks, who was studying dentistry at Union College. Yes, that makes three generations of teeth doctors, and by the 1870s, all were practicing in Cuba. Dr. Elihu Vetter was expelled by Cuba due to involvement in a failed revolution, and he'd wind up in St. Augustine. John Vetter would yet again join him around 1877. John opened a dentistry practice and also began displaying his collection of natural specimens in the office. The displays proved so popular, Vetter expanded the collection and began charging admission. In the mid-1880s, and while approaching the age of 70, it was clear where the profit was, and he retired from dentistry to focus on natural history. The original museum opened in his first building, near the cathedral. However, in 1887, a fire swept through downtown St. Augustine that destroyed a number of buildings, including the St. Augustine Cathedral and Vetter's Museum. The fire resulted in a complete loss of the building, but he was able to salvage much of the collection. The next year, it reopened in the Arcean House. Known as Dr. Vetter's Museum and Menagerie, it presented Florida's wild animals, birds, fish, crustaceans, and reptiles, It was arguably the first zoo in the city, predating the St. Augustine Alligator Farm by four years. The collection included either live or mounted alligators, cottonmouth moccasins, rattlesnakes, and coach whip snakes, birds of all sorts including bald eagles, sandhill cranes, pelicans, and barred owls, mink, manatee, opossum, bottle-headed whale, Jewfish, porpoise, electric ray, octopus, seahorse, leatherback turtle, spotted ray, and of course, stingrays. Vetter did most of the taxidermy himself. Ads promoted a monster man-eater shark 
and the largest monster sunfish in the world that was 10 foot or 3 meters from fin tip to fin tip. The museum also featured a gift shop offering alligators, both live and artistically mounted in all sizes, plus birds, bird skins, plumes, and feathers, as well as locally collected artifacts and other souvenirs. A contemporary newspaper article mentioned that the museum had, quote, a fine old snake who always shows his resentment of the near approach of strangers by sounding his rattles, and a crane whose loss of a leg has been artfully supplemented by a wooden contrivance, thereby giving him, while in motion, the appearance of being in his cups. The term, being in his cups, is a phrase that means someone is drunk. Vetter died in 1899 at the age of 80, and his museum was purchased by the St. Augustine Historical Society, who kept it open until 1914. In that year, the last of St. Augustine's large fires occurred. Beginning in the kitchen boiler room of the Florida House on Treasury Street before daybreak, the fire destroyed nearly every building from Treasury Street North to the old city gates and from St. George to Bay. This included the Opera House, Courthouse, Six Hotels, and Vetter's Museum. Most of the buildings were built of coquina, but between the intensity of the fire and the work of the fire department, most of the stone-walled buildings, including the museum, collapsed. The local fire department couldn't stop the fire, so they summoned help from Jacksonville's fire department, who arrived by train. The Vetter collection was destroyed along with the building. These battered low stone walls are all that's left of the Arsian house with the current building constructed within the old house's footprint. Four years after the fire, the St. Augustine Historical Society had recovered and purchased the Gonzalez Alvarez house, which they still operate today as the oldest house. You can learn more about it in this video. With more than a dozen postcards and stereo cards showing Treasury Street, it's obvious that the 19th century tourists found it interesting, at least to some extent, and it's in the heart of the old city and connects with two additional attractions. All three touched on both Spanish periods, the brief British period, and when it became part of the U.S. It provides a quick path to the waterside and views of the Bridge of Lions and the lighthouse on Anastasia Island. The three locations help tell the story of St. Augustine's more than 450 year history, even if they are mostly forgotten by today's tourists. Next time you're in the old city, drop by Treasury Street and strike that classic pose. Touch the foundation of Vetter's Museum to see if you can hear that old rattler's resentment. Then, drop by the old treasury and help out some artists and women in need. Thank you for watching another of my videos. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.